Welcome to the risk working group meeting for April 1st, 2021. We will try not to do any April foolish kinds of things. Um, this is the, uh, these are the minutes that I put into the chat. Can't remember if anyone's joined since I put the link in, but I added again because of Zoom's particularities. I thought we would start today with some introductions since uh, Arfan's joining us. And I don't know if Dhruv has been here uh, previously. I think he might have been last time. But uh, yeah. uh, Dhruv, maybe if you want to introduce, or Dhruv or Arfan, maybe if you want to introduce yourselves. And the rest of us can do the same real quick. Sure, I can. Uh... Say hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Alvon Smith. I um, work at GitHub and I, uh, what do I know? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I know some stuff about open source. I'm really interested in open source communities and what's going on on the platform. Um, I run a project called the Journal of Open Source Software. I'm the editor in chief for that. Um, and this is my second time working at GitHub. Um, I left in 2016, came back about nine months ago. Um, my role at GitHub today is in, uh, I'm in the product org, um, and so I'm the uh, product manager for the data uh, org, which includes our data science teams, uh, data engineering, and what we call data experience, which is kind of like how customers internally interact with uh, data. And, um, but we also, run like the data warehouse and uh, things like that. So um, I'm especially interested in this um, group. I'm interested in chaos. Uh, I know Matt and um, Sean, uh, we go back a bit. Um, uh, in fact, to my previous time at GitHub, I think. Um, and I'm interested in, oh, I also know Elizabeth who's here. We used to work together at GitHub, so that's cool. Uh, sorry, I didn't see your face on the call yet. Um, but I, um, I'm i interested in uh, this group, especially because uh, the part of the org that I sit within is called data and security products. And so we actually, um, uh, the sort of one big area of focus for GitHub right now is, is sort of, you know, how can we make smarter use of data on the platform to make open source more secure and secure the open source supply chain. And so that's a big, uh, big focus for, for the sort of business unit that I'm in. So sorry, that was a bit long, but. No, that's exciting to, um, to hear that you're in that role. People should know that uh, chaos came, uh, was conceived as a concept in a conversation between Matt and Arfan in Fredericksburg, um, Copenhagen in uh, June of 2015. And I nosed into that conversation to, to join because I was also interested. So Arfan's history with chaos goes back uh, quite a long way to the origins. Um, and Dhruv, uh, are you also new or Riddick? Have you been here before? Uh, not uh, really. This is my first time here. Okay. You want a brief introduction? Uh, I'm Riddick Malik. I am uh, in the pre final year of my uh, um, university, and I'm a. Uh, one second. I'm having some issues with my microphone. Okay. And Drew, uh, Drew, have you you've been here before or no? I can't recall. You've been in some working yeah, groups. I, I have been here. Before. Okay. All right. So that let's move on from the introductions then. Uh, what we've been doing. So just a little background for everyone. What we've been doing is focusing, uh, sort of understanding what we mean by dependencies and. We're right now focused on what we're calling the minimum viable product for, um, for dependency metrics. And not to jump from two to four, but it might be useful to just open up the minimum viable product spreadsheet and just get an overview of essentially enumerating the repositories that uh, projects that your project depends on are looking at sustainability. So if, if we look at work the world from a repo perspective, what is your repo dependent upon? And then fan out and access and, and about, uh, you know, can calculate chaos metrics for those dependencies. 
dependency range, you know, how many times is it a, a single dependency referenced in your product? So you might have a dependency that's mentioned in nearly every component or one that only exists in a single place. Lib years is a metric that is for projects and libraries. My project depends on a total number or an average number of libraries that are of an average or total age. So in some sense, there's a little bit of a signal in if you're dependent on really old versions of libraries that might suggest a risk. We want to enumerate uh, known vulnerabilities. There are several sources for this, including the National Vulnerabil Vulnerabilities Database, as, as well as other sources. There's a project called OSF Scorecard, uh, which is uh, the GitHub repo is linked there. And then sort of creating a matrix of if there's a known vulnerability and the project is not active, um, there's a combination of these two things that create greater risk. So in terms of the focus of this working group, those are the things that we're targeting. And um, the one, um, we're, we're working on language level upstream dependency enumeration as a metric right now. And one of the things that we do during these meetings is work on metrics. So often we stop the recording and, and work on a metric, but maybe before I jump into that, I'll ask if there are any topics on the agenda that folks want to jump to first before we go to work. I'm putting a comment in on your spreadsheet. So can I ask a clarifying question on the metric? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> is lib years um how out of date you are with your dependency like so my or is it like some sense of the maturity of the package because those it seem like different things it, it, it's how out of date you are with the current version of the dependency got it that sounds um, yeah, makes sense if, yeah if david wheeler were here he might correct me but I've, I've come to understand that that's what a lib year is. So if your oldest library is stable and hasn't been updated in three years, and perhaps there's no reason for it to have been updated, uh, that that isn't the concern. The concern is if there have been 11 releases of a, of a dependency since the one that you're dependent on, that would be a, a lib year count that would be, you know, you're four years off the latest release. And, yes. and that, that might Makes suggest sense. that your dependencies are not so hot. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Sure. I have like a weird little nuance thing that I noticed this week just because I was working on some internal dependency analysis is that in some of our build dependencies, I was seeing a lot of self-referential dependencies <laughs> in terms huh. of nested in the same repository. So I had to go through and filter those out. So. I know that's maybe not adding too much complexity, but I was thinking a lot about nested dependencies or circular dependencies that could come out. And I'm wondering how, just I'm kind of raising it now, just as we're talking through some of those different characteristics that you raised in the last sheet, um, how we want to state those explicitly to either encourage them to be filtered out and or addressed separately. If I'm understanding your point, I have, let's say a simple project with five dependencies and one of those dependencies also has a dependency on one of the other five dependencies. And is that what you mean? Um, sort of. So I would consider that a transitive dependency. So mm -hmm. not indirect, but sort of then that ended, that dependency has a dependency on. Um, circular means that if you follow that chain, eventually it points back to itself. Um, and then a nested dependency is, I was like looking at a whole all the build files required to run something might refer back to other build files in the same folder. So it's those aren't really dependencies because that's just how you structured your code base. But yeah, yeah, in your yeah. Dependency, it build dependency also because it's a separate file. Um, so that was just the technicality of the the tool that we were using. So there's there there are, I think there's two issues I'm hearing. One is de dependencies um, on components 
in a repository and that's the circular example right um it could be considered circular um i was thinking circular more being transitive to transitive to transitive back to yourself <laughs> so it's there's are kind of weird edge cases that i don't want to derail the conversation i just wanted to mark them so that when we're ironing out some of the details of some of these definitions that we consider what those edge cases imply by what we're recommending yeah and and to the if you have repositories that you can point us to to illustrate that at some point that those would that would be a i think helpful for my understanding but there was a second part of what you said there was those dependencies on components which are transitive to transitive to transitive to back to your repository and there was one other item right i mean i see three i see nested transitive and circular so i'd say that's but you have that already listed at the top so i'd say we're all set with that okay that's that, that those are really good those are really good points and i i, uh, I haven't you know i i could say i have not encountered that but i can also say i haven't looked real closely to identify that either so well, it was one of those fun cases where like in my job i had to run some dependency analysis on the fly and i was like oh look extra considerations <laughs> <laughs> excellent nothing like hands-on to figure these things out eh? <laughs> i completely believe it there everything is abstract and so you look at the code well i remember when you're doing builds of distro builds and the seeds mm -hmm. you know when you're basically checking it through there's elements of iteration that have to happen um, to actually get to the stage, so it doesn't surprise me at all. As I think about it hard, it doesn't surprise me, but I haven't well, no, like, thought about know, it before. To, <laughs> you know, to, to build a compi uh, new compiler, right, it takes three iterations before you can stabilize everything. Right. So, so Sophia, are these the three that you mentioned, nested, transitive, and circular dependencies, are these necessarily metrics on their own? Are they... Are they risks, things to think about from a risk perspective? They're, when you are contextualizing the metrics that you're, you've produced. So if say, I, in this case, I ran a dependency analysis on a mirrored repository in a, in, or internal source code, and I had to filter out a third of them because they were all from the same nested repository because it was counting them as separate build dependencies, even though it was within it. Um, and then something like transitive, that's if you're considering what those things are dependent on. So I, it, it's more, I think in one of our initial definitions, we had started to define whether or not we wanted to focus on direct or indirect dependency. So I would say indirect with transitive, we can use interchangeably, we might want to pick a word so that we're consistent. Um, but then it sort of the impact of looking at transitive and indirect dependencies is that eventually you could keep following the chain and the chain might go all the way around, which is worth knowing because that sort of produces some awkwardness. And I, there was recently a blog post about that that I could share that looked at a couple of examples where circular dependencies were coming up. Um, and I don't think that's, I would say as a risk metric would be bad. Um, but again, these are, these are more edge cases and more when you're actually looking at creating metrics around dependencies that there's some nuance to the data that you're collecting that will make it less useful for you. So like if I know I have 30 dependencies, but 10 are from the same file, then it's really only gotcha. 20 dependencies. Gotcha, that it's not all just this one-to-one -one linear relationship perfectly mapped out where everything's just a, a wonderful tree from yeah. top to bottom, okay. I, I, yeah, again, I think I'm derailing a bit, but it's more, this was something that I was dealing with this past week. So I wanted to mention mm -hmm. it, I thought it might be helpful in later iterations of this. Well, I guess one of the things that I'm wondering, sorry for the illusion here, but like a, kind of a chicken and an egg question, like, do I care about this first and then the metrics that are currently being developed or do I, see what I'm saying? Or do I kind of I'll try to understand the metrics and then say, well, hold on, before we do the interpretation of this metric, I need to understand some of the metrics context next. I would say we should do the metric and then test them against these problems. Like okay. are the cases gonna come up in this metric? And if they are, then maybe we need to have separate contextual guidance around how to handle the weirdness that will change your data. Okay, so this metric means one thing in 
in a situation where we have circular dependencies. And this metric means probably a little bit something else when we don't have these circular dependencies when essentially everything's transitive. Is that fair to say? Sure. Okay. It, it, is it also fair to say that the the impact could look the same with a particular metric that we define, but knowing this this classification where it sits in these classifications might mean something completely different if we actually went to the next level. I think so from a risk perspective. So mm -hmm. if the goal of defining these metrics is to be able to definitively state a level of relative risk, mm -hmm. then say direct dependencies are more important than indirect dependencies, but you will still be impacted if there are say vulnerabilities happening at those indirects because the things that you depend on depend on them. So it's your, but then there's a level of, I guess, abstraction where you assume someone else, it's someone else's problem. <laughs> so, that, that could, so you can interpret that as more or less risky for you as the person depending on it and that you can rely or hopefully rely on someone else to be able to um, address the issue. But then you're also now relying on someone else to address the issue. So depending on how you calculate your risk, it could be greater or less. Something like circular dependencies, I would say would be the most risky in that scenario, because then you have to figure out how to, how to remove that circular dependency, because at a certain point it doesn't, I, I feel like then you're dependent on yourself. It gets a little bit hokey. Like I'm not quite sure how to, how to enumerate that in a way that means it's more or less risky, but it's, I need to find this post again, just because I feel like it's it's a different kind of case that does change the risk profile of what you're considering. So yeah. if the end goal of the metric is to be able to say, this is a, a more or less risky choice for your project, then I would say that that these elements would influence it. When, that makes sense. When, when you say circular dependencies, I think of JavaScript. Yeah. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of circular dependencies inside those libraries. Um, and that does increase risk. Uh, so I get it. So that the next, so the next thing, I mean, like these, these agenda items are in kind of an order, um, but they're not in a canonical order. So the next thing I have on here is to try to continue our work on language level upstream dependency enumeration. And um, the, uh, but I'm open to reorganizing or ordering the list as people see fit. Before we move on, I, I really like how we have the definitions of type of dependencies here. Can we write one in for nested? Right now we just have the question mark here. Uh, Anonymous Panda is going at it. That's me. Three question know. marks. <laughs> That's worse. Way to elaborate. <laughs> Subdependencies, yes. So these are ref within a, I would say, is he, this is within a repository for the nested ones? Do we also have a direct dependency or first level dependency? First order. First order. Yes, the, the original easiest dependency. And then transitive and indirect dependencies. I, I thought they were two different things. I thought transitive dependencies is where we go from one dependency to the next, to the next, to the next. And indirect dependencies are like compiler or operating systems where it's not defined in the code, it's by the context that we have the dependency. I assume like indirect dependency is not the first you are dependent on, but the second one and onwards. 
So it's like I think, we, I think we need to get some, defini get some definitions down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Done yeah that. I'm plus that one as well, because I think there are many ways you can interpret it. So we should pick one and go with it. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like Georg had a slightly different interpretation of indirect dependencies being maybe not like out of, out of context or a different context level dependency versus transitive being more the secondary chain. And what, what Georg defined as indirect dependencies in my definitional brain are infrastructure dependencies. So there, your software isn't directly dependent on, I mean, of course you have to run it on an operating system, but it's not a dependency in the sense of that we think of a software bill of materials style dependency. Is it like an environment, environmental dependency then? Right, like I need an operating system. I need a database. Mm. Um, there isn't really a direct dependency. It's, it, I can, in my head, I've created the word, the concept of an infrastructure dependency where I need this infrastructure to run this software. Is that what you meant, Georg, when you, when you were talking about transitive or indirect dependencies? For, for the indirect dependencies, that's what I thought, where it's not obviously clear just looking at the source code and following the traces. Right. But we, we need that infrastructure. We need those database operating systems, the programming language, we depend on that. Just, uh, just a thought, um, the people who thought about this are people who care about reproducibility. Mm -hmm. And so like, what do you need to bundle a piece of software such that it might run for a long time? Um, I feel like they might have a taxonomy of ways to think about like the different aspects of reproducibility. This is, I'm getting flashbacks to those discussions. So yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. I'll start. Please. So I can try and dig out some books there um, if that would be helpful, but it certainly feels a bit like that, especially when we get into the environment level stuff. Yeah, I think if someone else has defined this already, I'd love Let's to just use it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. We don't want to create new language that's going to confuse people. I mean, we, we spent a whole day talking about downstream versus upstream and whether or not that was clear to people. So I feel like this is the same argument, not argument, but just point that there is not necessarily complete clarity in what these mean for all people. Mm -hmm. I can I can take a look as well because I know we I've seen some other work on dependency taxonomies. Um, who Arfan, you said a specific group of people may have already defined this taxonomy. Yeah, reproducible builds. Reproducible builds. Right. I'm busy clicking through it right now to see if I can find something along this line. They certainly need to know about it. Definitions. Um, I just made a comment there that may already be defined somewhere. Yeah, if I refer to it. Okay, thanks for indulging this definition exercise. No, I think you you drew out some some of the you eliminated some of the ambiguity and also helped us get pointed to a potential resource that defines these things already. Yeah, <clears throat> would save us the trouble of trying to define them ourselves once more. So should we press on to metrics in progress and do a little work? Sure. All right, so risk language level upstream is one of the ones we have been working on. And so these are projects that my project depends on. That's what upstream is. We, I put that in there because we frequently have to remind ourselves of the difference between upstream and downstream. And if, if folks wanna take a minute to read through what we have here, generally the practice we have is we'll spend about 10 minutes uh, working through advancing this definition. And, and this one looks reasonably, you know, it's, it's 
partially developed, but it's not complete. Um, the aim of the metric is to understand code-based dependencies embedded in software, and it explicitly excludes infrastructure-focused dependencies like databases, OS. Uh, and we have chosen to define those in, in something called an upstream infrastructure dependency metric. So that exists somewhere on the risk on the risk list. Can I make one, one comment? Please. In the common working group today, before we worked on a metric, we asked everybody to take a look at the title of this mm -hmm. metric. Yeah. And try to figure out what that title means without reading anything else. <laughs> All you can read is the title. You have to put your hands up and not read anything else. So, and the reason we did this is because if we all understand the metric differently, then if our fund goes to start editing and Sophia goes to start editing and I go to start editing, it all goes it's a Frank, up. It's a Franken metric. It goes away. It all goes to different directions. So just based on the title, do people know what this means? You can answer no. I think I know what it means, but I'm going to wait for others to respond first. I can respond based on the title within the bracket. I can say it's like what uh, project, other projects my project is dependent on. But if mm -hmm. I look at the language level, then I am thinking of like what other languages my yeah. project is dependent on. I, I, I'm finding upstream dependency enumeration on its own without the language. I think language level is confusing more than anything else. Okay. We added language level because we wanted to clarify that we want to stay within like Java if you're looking right, at Java. Yeah, but, but realistically, it's enough. You know, I think that belongs in the definition or the description that you're limiting it that to a, within a language thing, but um, language level itself is not a commonly understood term. Saying language level, you know. Um, I, have, I have not seen level it word. Elsewhere. I think maybe it's reacting. To, I'm reacting to them. Maybe. I'd rather CS be consistent and just say code based. Yeah. Or that, as we say in the in the description, instead of a language level. Mm -hmm. Is and by enumeration, it. do we just mean listing them all? Is yeah, that what we, mean? We, want, yeah. we want to list them all. So I would, I agree. I, I got hung up on language level. I thought about it and realized that you meant within the programming language, but because we just had that conversation about operating systems and databases. So I actually think you could just say upstream dependencies, brackets, within language or something or co at code level or something. I don't know, it feels like another term here would be like upstream dependencies, brackets, libraries or something, things that you depend on. And then it makes it sound like it's code level. But, yeah, like, so. and I think the most important thing is the it's an upstream dependency as opposed to a code level. So starting it off that way might make more. I was also just gonna ask for um, formatting clarification. Can we put something in the, the brackets or is that something that's going to get removed when we publish it not consistent so we wouldn't like, want to have like parentheses yeah yeah okay. so in the, in the evolution working group we created metrics for things everyone calls a commit that uh, we call code changes and people get confused so we're going to add in brackets commits as a word so that everyone knows what it is we're talking about so that is it's still not a pretty that's not a very standard practice right to use mm -hmm. parentheses perhaps we will use a colon <laughs> well we just had our style guide come through last week so maybe we i don't want to say we propose a change immediately but whatever we do we <laughs> want to let the rest of the group know in case that they have the same interest because i think it makes sense for dependencies given that there's so many kinds that we might want to add more specificity into that metric name 
than other groups might. But I that, have to that's that totally group. fine. Yeah, that's a okay on that one. So is upstream dependencies our metric name? And then we add this description elsewhere. Stream dependencies makes complete sense to my brain, but I know I suggest well, I, I, or suggested what dependencies. I, <laughs> what I recall from previous discussion when David Wheeler was here, he specifically wanted this language because he was confused whether it's an infrastructure dependency upstream or it's a database or something else. So that's where this conversation was driven that we want a language a specific dependency or something along. Yeah, I would, I would say if David Wheeler was here, he would be arguing against these changes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's okay, <laughs> he'll show up again. <laughs> no, he, he, let me know, he let me know he couldn't be here today and he yeah, wanted to. I know, you know, he's got a conflict on that. So we're gonna go with upstream de and upstream dependencies. Is Sophia, word. did you have a comment too? You were well, you had the word code base in there earlier. Yeah. We could add that back in to differentiate between database infrastructure people and all the other kinds of dependencies you could have. Uh, maybe then maybe upstream code dependencies and just leave it like that. It's it, code base dependencies is in the description. And so it's a nuance. But then, but yeah, then also, to Vinod's point and then to Sophia's point too of a little bit more granularity. In the titles, I think that would help a ton. I agree with that too. So, is it upstream code dependencies? Works for me. It at least provides clarity for all of us to edit on this document. It's a working title we can work with and then change it when we see the need. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Should we pause the recording while we work on this? Um, yeah, I think not, now we've reached the time where the recording of what we do is of less utility. So I am. When David uh, can find out and listen to the discussion if he wishes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs>